Hello everyone. Um, there's a few things I would like to offer as I'm making this recording, these recordings. Um, I think usually I would probably have waited a little longer to one to gather a little more material around these topics and two to just uh, hope that I felt a little bit more capable um, physically and mentally. Um, but despite yeah, despite the difficulties, I, th I think um, it's probably wiser not to wait and uh, just take this window of opportunity as as it presents itself right now. Um, as don't know what the future will bring. So a few things I wanted to offer, and really they're uh, mostly they're kind of exercises. That's the way I'm thinking about them, like etudes or exercises or preliminaries, if you know that word um, uh, that's used in uh, Tibetan Buddhist circle. Preliminary exercises preliminary trainings, preliminary requirements, preliminary developments. Of course, it's a little strange, um, however many years we are into unfolding the soul-making teachings, to start now putting out, uh, you know, beginning to accrue a set of preliminary exercises, but the teachings have grown very organically uh, and um, as, as we grow... We, we, we kind of recognize uh, this is needed, that's needed, this is um, what we need to add here. So it doesn't matter anyway. Um, so I'd like to offer some what we might call preliminaries, some exercises. Primarily, these exercises are um, uh, involve, center around movement and gesture. So the physical body and movement and gesture, or the, the bodily experience, let's say, movement and, and gesture, and voice. Movement, gesture, and voice. And woven into that, hopefully I'd like to kind of include uh, some thoughts and teachings about soul, about personhood, and about human being, anthropology, if you like, because it's very much woven in to the way we're thinking about all this. So preliminary is at this, this, you know, this stage of development of the, of the growth, the organic growth of the teachings. Um, this is a beginning, and a beginning at least to this, uh, this offering of, of this, whatever I will offer in these talks, is, is a beginning that can hopefully be developed. It should be developed. It will naturally, uh, should naturally evoke, suggest, elicit um, de development. And hopefully that development will be um, very discerning, congruent, sensitive, appropriate, intelligent. Movement, gesture, voice, these are huge areas. And we can add all kinds of things willy-nilly just because we like it or we have a history there, or it makes us feel good, or whatever. But um, hopefully, uh, this, these, these kinds of exercises can be added to, and can be developed. And naturally, is the way of soul-making, uh, of things that get uh, swept up into the soul-making dynamic, they will develop, they have to develop. Um, so, this is the beginning. Hopefully, they will be developed and grow and become more sophisticated, wider, further, deeper, etc., more varied. Um, actually, it's not even a, a, a complete beginning, because I have, and many of you will already know, that um, there have been other teachings um, offered on, uh, on that, that focus on movement, gesture, voice, etc. So in a way... What we're going to say in these talks, offer in these talks, um, adds to that thread um, that's already there. In fact, through other talks, through other exercises I've given out in the past, through instructions and guided med meditations um, from the past, however long it is, five years or whatever, six years. Um, and I can't remember uh, the names. I remember I had a quick look before uh, earlier today, so there was... 
a couple of talks called Voice, Movement and the Possibilities of Soul. Uh, guided meditations, exercises, instructions on there. There's something called the Movement of Devotion, if I remember, and a couple of versions of that. And perhaps they may have been the first one. I think I explained, well, I just started it all too subtle, um, too difficult for, for a first teaching. So as I said, the teachings are growing kind of organically rather than any linear way. They're presented over the years in... Uh, you know, chrono- the chronological order of presentation of the years doesn't necessarily match how one would, if one was starting from zero, so to speak, to unfold the soul-making time. It doesn't at all match that. Anyway, so there's that one movement of devotion. There's even things, um, uh, for example, guided meditations we did, um, hearing all sounds as mantra, a jewel line world, things like uh, th- those kinds of things that we've done. Um, where there's a lot going on. There's a lot of instructions going out. I'm asking people in the room to chant and move and do this and that and interact with each other. And while they're doing that, I may have been giving instructions, um, kind of throwing them into the space at the same time. And so very, uh, very uh, understandable if a lot of those instructions didn't get so well absorbed. Um, taken on if that kind of practice didn't get built on and repeated, um, if the principles hidden in those instructions that were in the mix of this very complex, uh, effectively intense social situation, guided meditation, new experiences, etc., um, very understandable if the principles hidden in the instructions, um, underlying the instructions, undergirding the instructions, were not uh, drawn out and capitalized upon and made clear, of course. Um, very understandable. And also, too, in um, similarly in rituals and ceremonies that we've done, we've played with, there's often kind of background instructions thrown in. But there's so much going on in the choreography and the sociality and interactions of, of that whole uh, larger situation there that it would be very surprising if if those were um, taken on board as instructions in a way that one, one would actually build on them or even recognize that there was anything there to build on or to extract. So all that's completely understandable. And even recently, in the last few months, I remember in um, it was one of those online seminars, I can't remember what it was called, but it was something to do with engagement and activism. And I remember just saying something about the energy body and devotion and... Uh, and throwing something out and intending it really as a set of meditation instructions. But I was way too quick, way too quick in in explaining that and expecting people to actually hear, oh, this is a set of instructions, Um, and I can take this and practice it and do it a lot like I do my breath meditation a lot. um, So I didn't set it up that way. I didn't take the time that way um, just because... There's a million other things to talk about. Well, it seems to me there always is. <laughs> so I'm always in a rush. And similarly on the jhana retreat, actually on the jhana retreat at some point, might even have been in the opening talk, I did guide people very briefly through um, a meditation with body and devotion and energy body, etc. But again, how many people will actually take that out and e- extract it and capitalize on it and repeat it, isolate it and repeat it as something, as a practice, as a set of instructions that are developable, um, remains to be seen. Um, Anyway, so a beginning here that will be developable, but actually not really a beginning because it ties in with other threads that we've put out in all these different talks. And so... um, in a way, following on from what I've just said, uh, an implication, which here I'm going to draw it out now, um, one could, if one gets really interested in this stuff, go back to all those talks and listen again and listen to what's being said in the background and those instructions that one might miss and and take the material out, um, extract it, uh, write it down, make a set of instructions, start practicing it. Um, So there's an invitation there. Of course, that's much more work for you as a listener or as a sangha than if I just offer these instructions there and it's it's um, a separate thing and you can just all you have to do is press play and follow the instructions 
Um, but there's the invitation. So, why this area? I'm going to explain more why this area around movement, gesture, and voice. I'm going to explain more later as, as we go on. But uh, it's co- very much connected with this idea of preliminaries and what's, what's necessary, what's required to, if we use a certain analogy, to, to be able to fly in soul-making practice, to really be able to soar on the air currents and glide easily and uh, gracefully and freely to wheel around and cartwheel and maneuver. A lot is required. And sometimes the pieces that are required, you know, they're really obvious, like, well, two wings are required. Whatever that analogy might be in soul-making dharma. We need these, these really big structural pieces. But other times what's required um, may not be obvious at all. So in this beautiful bird's anatomy, there may be a tiny little bone somewhere that just connects, for instance, this part of um, uh, th- this uh, bone in the, in the neck, let's say, to, to, to a bone, a particular bone in the wings, a tiny little bone in the muscles, or a, or a tiny little muscle. It doesn't seem that significant, but take it away, and maybe the bird can even still fly a little bit, but what its freedom of movement, its ease, its gracefulness, its uh, security, uh, severely curtailed there. Um, So, to be able to fly, we need um, all kinds of things, some of which are obvious, and some of which are less obvious. And there are some trainings which are really obvious, and some trainings which are really less obvious. Or, and some which are obviously very central, and some which are really not. We don't actually notice them at first. So it fits. Uh, that might be something like, like that, as an analogy. Not central, but indispensable, really, in the long run, to really have that freedom of uh, the freedom to fly in soul-making practice, and the whole range of soul-making practice, and the whole potential range of soul-making practice. Or, you know, like a, like a, an airplane, similar, same analogy. You know, you look, oh, it needs its engine, it needs its um, propellers or whatever it are, wings, of course, it needs a, this and that. Um, but maybe there's just one bolt somewhere, and, and it's just a tiny little piece, but if it's missing, it's a big deal. And maybe you only notice it when you're trying to do a certain thing, like, I don't know, land or turn around or, or whatever it is. So, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the soul-making dynamic should be clear to you by now from past teachings. The soul-making dynamic will eventually expand. Because of the way the Eurocyclogus dynamic works, it will expand, and it will expand to include within itself, to involve within its dynamic, within its um, uh, create creativity and discovery, it will include to expand every aspect of our being and every aspect of our life. Even more aspects than we even realize exist now. I didn't even know I had that aspect to my being or that aspect to my life. And then it starts to come uh, to be involved, to be ensouled, to be involved in the soul-making dynamic. And it starts to, to uh, become involved in the soul-making dynamic and, and included in uh, that aspect becomes included. So just so, as the soul-making dynamic expands, it should, it wants naturally to start including movement, gesture, and voice. And these areas, movement, gesture, and voice, can also be particularly er- particular areas where um, our relationship uh, to them is also, without us even realizing it, a little bit blocked. We're blocking something there. We're holding back something there so that the soul-making dynamic can actually... Uh, doesn't naturally flow in to open them further. It doesn't actually manage to quite reach them, and we don't quite realize it. I'm going to expand on this later. So there's there's a number of reasons why uh, why this this particular focus, movement, gesture, voice, right now. 
but again, by way of uh, introduction, slightly long introduction, um, before we get on to the material, I want to say something also about listening. And it connects with um, something I said just now anyway. I think often when I'm teaching, I, I probably go too fast. I speak very quickly and I, I a, for me it feels like there's a lot to say, a lot to put in a talk. There's so much, so much I want to share and there's so much I want to convey and time is limited in all kinds of ways. Um, but often I'm, I'm aware, I go very fast. And you know, occasionally a person says to me, oh, I heard your talks, it's mostly repeat. Um, and when I hear a little bit back about what they're thinking and how they're practicing, etc., it's clear that they've just missed a lot. They're not hearing a lot of details. Um, so I actually think the opposite is true. I'm, I'm going too fast rather than I'm just lingering a lot and repeating. What I often don't do is exactly stop and give you an exercise, give you homework, and especially if I'm recording like I am now, alone at home. On retreat, sometimes slow things down, you can feel what's happening in the room and what's appropriate with, with what people need there. But often I don't stop and, and isolate something, extract something, and point it out. This is a set of instructions, one, two, three, four, five, right, do that and set it up and give it a name and give it a, you know, make it a thing. Um, And again, it's just not very skillful teaching to expect people to do that. Partly, partly naively, a part of me was expecting that or has been in the past. And I just don't, I I think it's naive. So, time is still limited. I'm going to try and do exactly that, give you you exercises to do, etc. But still... When you listen um, to this, uh, these set of talks, when you listen to talks that have already been given, uh, maybe by me, maybe by another teacher, um, is it possible to think about listening more actively? That actually, that there might be uh, a job for you, or several jobs for you to do as a listener, and one of them might be for you to actively extract meditations, exercises from what's being said? Or would it be to listen to talk, even maybe talk you've listened to before and you just haven't listened with those kinds of ears on? There's a kind of, I uh, just sit and I kind of um, hear it and it touches me or I kind of get the ideas or whatever. What would it be to actually put that, uh, the hat of that particular job on? You're actually actively extracting meditations and exercises. Number one. Number two, is it possible to actively extract larger principles? Yeah, sometimes these are um, even less obvious. You know, of course, sometimes I'll linger a lot on a larger principle and explaining something and why it's important and what the concept is and how it all fits together and even why it's important in our history and all, all kinds of stuff. But sometimes not, uh, or to diff- differing degrees. So what would it be for you as a listener also to listen um, uh, at times with the hat on, uh, listening to extract larger principles, which are sometimes less obvious. And they'll be, as I said before, especially less obvious if I don't even bother to explain um, why we're doing this or that in a certain ritual or ceremony that we've just made up and maybe we'll just do once. Of course, that's not going to be obvious, but uh, there are there are reasons, you know, why we choose to do this, or why I said that, or why, or all of it. And so that takes a, a, quite a lot of intelligence, perhaps, to listen that way and try and extract those larger principles. So two possibilities: some for for, for listening at different times, extracting meditation possibilities and exercises. Number one, number two, extracting larger principles, which may be more or less explicit. And just like the uh, exercises, they may I may make a very light suggestion, may be explicit, but I just touch on it so quickly, may just be implicit in what I'm saying. Okay, so there's an invitation. Can you maybe think about doing that sometimes, experiment with that kind of listening. 
I taught a recent uh, retreat at Guy House on the theme of the jhanas, jhana practice, and one of the things I mentioned there was about inertia and our inertia as practitioners, as students of the Dharma, but also as um, as human beings. And I would have, had there been more time, spent a lot longer uh, really exploring that theme of inertia and really asking people to inquire into uh, where does where does inertia, how and where, and in what ways does inertia operate for them in the way they relate to their practice, in the way that they practice, in the way that they listen, what they practice and how they practice, all that. To me, there's a huge, really, really important inquiry there. Um, but I just mentioned it on the retreat and sort of pulled back from giving people too much to do, even though we had three and a half weeks. Still felt like it would be a bit much. But in my mind, it felt like actually really, really important. Recently, um, still on this theme of listening, recently, um, Nick and Sarah were listening to some talks, a set of talks, and they, and they were listening together, and uh, as people sometimes do, and they they decided to, well, I don't know if decide or just spontaneously occurred that they would listen, and then they would sort of ask each other, oh, can I press pause for a sec? And they would pause, uh, someone would press pause, and they'd say, okay, they press pause, and and they would just, oh, someone, one person would say, should, should we just do that practice he just mentioned? And sometimes it was just that I was just implying a practice, or say, or just mentioning it. Um, it wasn't only it wasn't only that they pressed it when there was an actual guided meditation. So, uh, so now I'm going to do a guided meditation. Okay, let's let's you know do this. Um, so they were really listening in quite a different way, and being together enabled them to listen uh, in that way. They actually got into a kind of mode of listening where they were pressing pause quite a lot, or pressing pause to, to stop and actually discuss something that they'd just heard, or question something, or if one person didn't quite understand, or just question, that can't be right, or da 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 whatever. So sometimes a talk, a two-hour talk, I have no idea how long it ended, ended up taking them to listen to, but it certainly sounded like they were having a lot of fun doing it that way. Maybe it was more fun, I don't know. Maybe other times, of course, it's much more fun doing it on your own and listening right through, straight through, without interruption. Maybe they were digesting more, assimilating more. You know. So there's a question. But we can have, for instance, active listening modes, if we call all that active listening, as well as receptive listening, right? just to differing degrees, just letting it kind of come in without interrupting, without turning the soil, stopping to turn the soil. But what is it uh, to till the soil, to till the soul? It will need tilling at some point, the soil of the soul. And whether that's actually while I'm listening or after, or at some point it needs that, and that cannot happen without you being active and without you taking some kind of initiative and responsibility and making choices and being intelligent, sort of listening, I think I said on the recent retreat, listening on the tip of your toes or at the edge of your seat, on the tip of your toes, I think I said. Similar goes for reading. You know, some people are actually, unfortunately, a surprising, uh, surprising amount of people sort of um, make it clear that they read uh, seeing the freeze without doing any of the practices, or without really doing, without really spending much time at all on any of the practices. Well, you know, to, to, to my mind, it's like, how much can you hope to really get out of it? Um, there's not the working of the soil enough, and even reading it just um, too quickly, it's that particular, there's lots of books are, and lots of books aren't, but that particular, it's very dense. There's a lot there. You know, why that word? What does it mean? What does it imply? What does it suggest about my practice? What does it suggest about what I'm thinking and how what's being written or said might be a little bit different or even a lot different from what I'm actually thinking? So anyway, just this question about inertia and um, in, in this case an inertia about, about how we practice, also an inertia about how we listen. 
or an inertia in regards to, to how we listen. We get stuck in certain modes of listening, certain modes of reading. And it's, it takes a bit of work to push ourselves out of that particular kind of groove or rut, basically, that we're in. It's inertia in physics takes work to overcome, takes force to overcome. So again, there can be an inertia regarding what we hear, what we read, and where, without even realizing it, we actually end up hearing and end up reading what we already think we know. I'm actually just uh, chopping off, shaving off, just literally not hearing or seeing um, what doesn't actually fit into what I think I already know. And so I end up just uh, reading something uh, that's, in fact, quite quite different, or quite challenging to what I already know. And But I think I've just read something that's completely confirmed it, or just has said it in what I already know in different words. So there's all kinds of um, possibilities here for kind of energizing and uh, bringing some oomph and some electricity and some fire and some soul, some more soul, really, into their listening and reading. All kinds of possibilities. There's also the question, you know, when we're listening and reading about, and this is in relation to what I've just said, is, is, you know, we're partly, kind of, we can't help listening and reading, I think it's just the way consciousness needs to work, without kind of usually unconsciously having a process where we're determining or trying to determine, judging the significance of this or that thing that we're hearing right now. So here's a talk, it's an hour or whatever it is, two hours or whatever, this part's not that significant, that, that part's significant. Um, or here's, you know, something I'm reading, whatever. Um, so this, this, I think, is just uh, natural to the way we need to listen as human beings to structure, to make sense of what we're listening or what we're reading. What is the significance of this? How much significance does it have? Some of what we're going to get into in this uh offering this series of talks, or how long it will end up being, some of these exercises, they will not seem, or they probably will not seem that significant. So I'm going to say that right now. They probably will not seem that significant. It's a bit like that tiny little bone in at the bird's shoulder that just connects uh, the wing, or uh, one little bone um, in the wing, and instead of little little filaments of muscle in the wing, to uh, a small bone or another bone in, in, the, in the chest, whatever it is. It doesn't seem that significant. Or that bolt in the airplane. Some of these exam- uh, exercises won't seem that significant. We can tend to think, especially with soul-making practice, imaginal practice, well, if there's an image, especially if I clearly... Um, if I get a clear image and a clear sense of the image, that's significant. But if I'm just doing something and there's no real moving or gesturing or voice or something, there's no real image, it doesn't seem that, it may not seem that significant. So something can seem to have more impact. And it can certainly seem to be more uh, to the point of and in line with what um, you know, what imaginal practice is. Obviously, if there is an image and we're impacted, it can seem that that's more significant. But in the long run, it may not be. You might get a sort of wow image. Maybe in the long run, it was just some wow, and uh, you know, I've definitely felt impacted and affected, and it was beautiful and everything. But in the long run, it may not be that significant. Just the fact that we talk about imaginal practicing, well, obviously images are must be significant. Well, it, it may or may not be, relatively speaking. Sometimes it's hard to uh, really be that wisely discerning. 
in, 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 in assessing what actually is significant and what is its significance. It's hard. It's hard for us. So all this is very normal. I think I remember at some point using the phrase, I can't remember how often or even when it was, it feels like a long time ago, using the phrase structural listening. Can we listen to a Dharma talk structurally or read a book? Like for example, seeing the free structurally. Again, very, very rare, very rare to have that capacity to kind of um, listen for the larger structure of ideas and the sort of way it all hangs together and the progress of ideas there, the larger conceptual framework. What would it be to actually develop that capacity as well? That's a training. That's a big deal. So it's very rare. What would it be to listen or read for and from the whole conceptual framework? I'm listening for or I'm reading for to get a sense of what is the whole conceptual framework? And then when I think I have that, I'm listening from the perspective of the whole conceptual framework. And that listening from an understanding of the whole conceptual framework, holding it there, it frames my listening. Whether it's soul-making dharma, that conceptual framework, whether it's emptiness or you know, uh, mainstream dharma, whatever it is, that frames my listening and creates a kind of meta view from which I can then uh, discern with intelligence. I can then discern, it helps me to discern the relative significance and the relative place of this or that thing that I'm hearing, or this or that instruction, or this or that word even, that I'm hearing right now, or reading right now. This is hard, or, or it's very rare. It's rare for someone to have that as a sort of, that's normally the way they go about things. It does exist, but it's very rare. It can be trained. Listen, read, for and from the whole conceptual framework. In the end, it ends up being uh, a lot less work to do things that way, because things are ordered. I have, um, because the very conceptual framework tells me where things will be, it informs me about what I might do in practice at any moment. It suggests, it tells me how ideas fit together, so they're not just a random sort of, here's another idea, here's another idea, here's another one. And I've just got this pile of stuff to sort through, random sort of objects, all of which, most of which maybe look a little interesting or glistening or kind of curious or whatever. But how, you know, instead of this big structure where they fit together and I can understand uh, where things are, etc. Because I understand where things are and how they work, I can find them a lot easier. Things make sense, they're more accessible, I can make choices uh, a lot easier, a lot more intuitively, eventually, and a lot more intelligently, a lot more helpfully. So even just now, up to now, you know, we, we've thrown out this, this idea about inertia, and this question, it's like, actually taking on this question, this inquiry, where, where is the inertia for me in relation to Dharma practice? How and what I practice in relationship to how and what I study or hear or how I listen? Where is the inertia? And how does that inertia balance with a need for steadiness? I actually need to stay with something for a while. And then I can have, you know, I can get too, too kind of entrenched in something. So this inquiry into inertia. Now I would say that that inquiry into inertia, even though we're not really going into it at the moment, again I'm postponing it or just mentioning it, don't know if I'll ever get back to it. I would actually say that's more important as a teaching, as an inquiry. Structurally, it's more important at, at the meta level. It's more important than anything else that I might say in this set of talks about uh, movement and gesture or anything else. Similar thing on the recent jhana retreat. He has to talk about all these different techniques and where you can move between this jhana and that, and how you can, you know, do this and that. 
all really important stuff, great. What I think was much more important for most people, and if it wasn't during those three and a half weeks, it will be at some point, or it will have been at some point, it, much more important than all those little bits of really valuable technique, uh, was the whole relationship with desire, jhana practice being a goal-oriented practice. And I need a desire because I'm moving towards this. I want to achieve whatever it is, the third jhana or whatever. This is what I'm trying for. I have an aim. I need to put in uh, effort and I need desire. And then the whole question, the whole area of questions around difficulties, around complications, around my relationship with desire, my relationship with goals, my relationship with effort, all that comes up. How much stuff there is there much more important in the long run to uh, really be open that up, to understand oneself with that, to liberate oneself in relationship to desire, being able to sustain a desire, a deep desire, and move towards a goal without getting completely tied up in knots. First of all, it's important because I'm going to need that to do the jhana practice. As much as I need to hear this little tip or technique from moving between this jhana, from moving between this jhana and the other, I'm also going to bump in. I can't help but move in the domain of uh, my desires and the difficulties of my desires. So I'm going to need that for jhana practice. And it's a subject that's going to pertain to any other practice I do, pretty much dharma practice I do, and loads of stuff that's that's outside of my meditation practice just goes pertain to my life. So you can just structurally, it's a much, much more important uh, issue, an area of investigation and concern, and um, possibility of freedom in the broader sense, I mean freedom, than just technique, or this piece of technique. So again, it's, it's even here, we mentioned inertia in tonight, even that, it's, it's just structurally, isn't it? I mean, that's actually more important than anything else, even though these other pieces are, as I said, really important. Okay. So there's, there's a lot here, but I'm just, um, this is all by way of introduction. A little bit more introduction, actually, if you can stand it. Um, as I said, I will hopefully unfold more about the why of these exercises, why I am offering them now, why I'm emphasizing them now. And that, that will as as the talks unfold and the instructions unfold, I hopefully will um, include I intend to include more about the why. But just to say right now, of course, the why of these exercises is related to the why of practice in general. It has to be, right? Of course. Why would these exercises be... Rather, the, the, the why, the larger question of why I'm practicing informs the smaller question of why these exercises, why practice these exercises? Why might they be important? So, the why of these exercises is related to the bigger why of why why practice? Why am I practicing? It has to be, of course. Just think that through if it's not obvious. And that, of course, is, is intimately related to what we've been calling the, the fantasy of the path, the fantasy of the goal of the path, the fantasy of awakening, the fantasy of the self of, on the path, or fantasies. So the why of uh, these examples, the reasons why we're addressing, focusing, emphasizing, filling them out now, opening them out now, is related to the why of practice and, and the fantasies of practice, path, awakening, self as practitioner, self on the path. And most of you will have heard me talk about this or emphasize it's so crucial. These, the, this why... Why am I practicing? What's my idea of why I'm practicing? And what's my image or fantasy of practice, of path, of where it's leading? 
and of myself on the path. Those ideas and those images and fantasies will always have consequences, major, major consequences, consequences at every level of our Dharma practice, actually at every level of our life. Our ideas about why we practice and our fantasies of path, goal, self, awakening, etc. will have massive consequences, certainly in our practice, at every level of our practice, and also beyond our practice in the rest of our life. And and one of the questions is, A, do we realize it? Second question is, do we realize that these ideas and fantasies can be... Uh, can be limiting. They can also be nonsensical. So we can end up with a sort of conglomerate of ideas and fantasies about the why of practice and what what practice is and where we're going that actually don't really make sense together. They're not very coherent. They're also limiting. That's possible. That's very, very possible. They will always have consequences. The question is, are we, you know, do we want to unlimit them if they're limited in an unhelpful way? Do we want uh, them to be coherent and to make sense if they don't actually make sense once we start looking at them and questioning them and prodding them a bit? Which often we don't. Often practitioners don't really. We've talked about all this before in other talks. There will always be consequences. I have to realize that. I remember teaching in another country, this is quite some years ago now. And I was talking with a, a woman, um, and I can't remember the context, I don't think it was in an interview, it was either before or after the retreat, or some other situation, like, it may have been an interview, I can't remember, anyway. And she said to me, or to a group of us, I can't remember, my husband doesn't need to meditate. She was probably in her late 60s then, is my guess. And so, I could be wrong, but I'm assuming, and it sounded like actually her husband was a similar age. So. My husband doesn't need to, to meditate. And I don't know if she elaborated on that. Um, certainly my ears pricked up at that point. Um, my husband doesn't need to meditate. She may have said something like, or, or what she then said m- made it... Uh, implied that what she meant is he's al- he's already calm. He's already kind of a very steady character and calm, or something like that. And of course, implicit in that was her view that calmness and steadiness was the point of, and the goal, of meditation. And that's why she was coming to retreat, and that's why her husband didn't need to, because he was already calm and steady. I think that the situation wasn't such that I was uh, in the teacher role at that point, or or, or I can't even remember the situation exactly, but um, it didn't seem appropriate for me to, you know, uh, ask a question in response or, or probe that a little more. But to me, it was very clear that she was holding a very limited idea of what she was there for on retreat, what she hoped to get meditation from meditation, what meditation was for. And this was, in fact, borne out by other um, interactions I, I had with her and, and things I saw. Now, that's fine, if that's, if that's her view, um, uh, or if that's her um, thoroughly investigated view, and that's where she arrives at, freely and independently. This is all I want meditation to be. I know there's this option, that option, that option, that option, that option as well, but I actually just want it to be calm and steady because I've looked at my life and looked at everything else and all the other things, either I can get them elsewhere, I can understand the emptiness of awareness elsewhere, which is highly unlikely of course, but um, or some other kind of freedom I can get, whatever it is, um, or they're just not things I'm interested in. Okay, But... My sense was that she she hadn't actually thoroughly uh, opened up that inquiry. And so there was this quite small, um, small area delineated uh, for, for, for the sort of the range and the purpose of meditation and retreat and all that. And you could also, uh, as I said, you could pick that up in other ways in terms of her 
uh, responses and reactions to teachings that went beyond that. Now, it could have been something else. She or someone else could have said, it, you know, maybe not calm and steady. They could have replaced it by, oh, he, she, they have so much patience. They don't need to meditate. They're just so patient. Or they have just, you know, unshakable metta and compassion. They just seem to love everyone, and it's just not shakable. Someone can be really difficult or whatever, and they just... They're just always kind. They don't need to meditate. Or they have incredible equanimity. You know, this or that happens, and they're just really steady. Or they're just naturally mindful. You know, I forget this, and I forget that, or they're just naturally mindful. Or even, uh, they could they could say he, she, they, they don't experience a self. I've talked to them, and they don't actually experience a self. And they only experience this sort of flow of moment, or whatever it is that they would explain, etc., etc. It could be anything. We could put anything there. They don't need to meditate because fill it with whatever you want. But compare that to saying something like, um, my husband doesn't need to make art doesn't need to make music, or if they're, if they're an artist or a musician, doesn't need, um, if they're a scientific researcher, if we look at some of these other fantasies that we've talked about, uh, fantasies of the path, they don't need to, to do scientific research anymore, or ever. Um, or, or a fantasy of the lover. They don't need what? They don't need to make love, they don't need to spend time with their beloved, they don't need to uh, expand or let expand, support the expansion of the range of landscapes and soul territories that one moves through and in uh, with one's lover, creates and discovers with one's lover. To compare it to saying something like that, don't need to meditate because they, they don't need to make art. They don't need to make music. They don't need to do scientific research or any more scientific research. Or they don't need to be in love anymore, and uh, be in love, and do in love, and be together in love, in relationship anymore. That need, you know, to one who feels the, the need, in the, sense, the beauty of those needs, I mean, for some people they only really relate to the in love one, I don't know, but for me certainly, the scientific researcher, the artist, the, the you know, making music, meaning composing music, uh, etc., improvising music, whatever it is, um, to, to one who feels that need, feels the depth of that need, and the infinite depth of that need, those needs, and the beauty of those needs, the inexhaustibility of those needs, the mystery of those needs. It's not, those kind of needs are not needs that there is really an end to. Not if you're really uh, called that way. If the soul is called, if the soul is on fire. You don't think, oh, I get to the point where I don't need to, I don't need to do any more scientific research. I don't need to write any more music or whatever it is. I don't need to, um, etc. They're not they're not, uh, there's no end to that, and you wouldn't want there to be an end to it, because if there's an end to it, something has died. And it's not about reaching an end. It's not about achieving calmness, or I've just discovered, imagine some, you know, phys- I've just discovered this in physics. Great, okay, well, I, I think I'm done now. That's all I wanted to know. That's not how that kind of deep curiosity works. Or persons have, have written. You know, I wrote. I wrote one song. I wrote one piece of music. Or I had that. You know that time improvising there. I took a solo or whatever it was. And you know, I don't think I need to do it anymore. That's not how it works. It's insatiable. It's bottomless. It's not even ours. It's calling us from a distance that is um, uh, beyond. Uh, that is beyond us. It is, it is not ours and it's ours. It's infinitely far away and it's the most intimate, the most intimate thing 
It's not something that there's an end to. It's not something we would want there to be an end to. It comes out of love, out of beauty, out of eros and delight, out of soul, out of curiosity, out of the depths of our being, just as can the intention for meditation practice come out of love, of beauty, of eros, delight, soul, curiosity, depth, rather than I want to, you know, be steady like my husband is steady, or calmer, or whatever. Or even I want to experience this thing where I don't have a self and there's just a sort of flow of moments. Why stop there? Why stop there? Gosh, there's so much more than that. And wonderful as that might be, and of course, if you're listening to this and you're just, you know, kind of really uh, caught up in dukkha that seems like it has no, nothing but dukkha, of course we're going to want the calmness. And I've been, we've talked about this once before. But once you've reached, let's see, even that place where it's just, there's just this kind of open self, or there's just an open sense of awareness, and, and I'll put this in strong inverted commas, no self. Um, why stop there? Why stop there? Honestly, it would be like Einstein saying, I've done my special theory of relativity, I think I'll stop there. Or Beethoven saying, yeah, I wrote my second symphony, I think that's it now. Um, it doesn't make sense. It's, we're talking about allowing allowing a desire to come from a different place, recognizing that a desire comes from a different place. And this very much has to do, again, with who we are as human beings. It's mine and it's not mine. It comes from an infinite distance, an infinite beyond, and it's the most intimate thing. And it's beautiful. The desire itself is beautiful, so we wouldn't want it to end. And yes, along with that very desire, it brings difficulties. It brings frustrations, exasperations, challenges. Um, we feel we're stuck at different points. It burns. It hurts. There's disappointment. There's all that along with the beauty and the joys and the gifts and the creations, discoveries of it all. So, the why of these exercises is related to the why, why am I practicing, has to be related to that, in the larger sense. And that is related to my fantasy of the self and the path. All of this is tied together. What ideas, what images do I have of that are operating? How helpful are they? How limiting are they? How much sense do they even make? How coherent are they? They will have consequences. But even sometimes, you know, other um, very different um, situations. I remember talking to other people and being in, in very different Dharma backgrounds. And this woman I described who had been kind of basically also, uh, to be fair, uh, trained in from the beginning a presentation of the Dharma that didn't, didn't actually present the Dharma as much more than that. Um, so that's what she had been taught the Dharma was and... You know, anyway, so she was trained in that. Very different Dharma scene, thinking of different teachings. You know, sometimes people get into, uh, again, certain ideas about what they're doing, certain fantasies. The idea, because obviously the Dharma has to do with liberation and freedom, and therefore it has to do with not struggling. And if we're into something called non duality, then just drop the struggle right now and don't struggle in meditation. Don't struggle at all. Don't even struggle to stay awake. Don't struggle. Don't, don't just don't struggle. Um, or, um, or, or you know that idea together with the idea, and it often goes with sort of, um, I, I would say, narrow ideas of non-duality. Um, you know, don't deal with concepts, just don't be conceptual, just drop the whole conceptual thing. It's a lot more easy, simpler, less struggle, more spiritual, because non-conceptuality and spirituality go together, right? All these kind of things. And then out of that comes a kind of um, mode of practicing, 
effectively a technique, although one, one tries to think of it as not a technique, because one isn't struggling or supposedly not struggling and doing and not thinking, etc., etc., and it's non-dual. And the idea is that it's open, but actually it ends up being very closed, because we've cut off a bunch of possibilities. No, no struggling in any way at all. No thinking. You have to think. Um, we have to conceive. Uh, the only little bit of conceiving you're allowed is, is that conceiving isn't allowed, and try and be non-dualistic, etc. Whatever that means. But what that also means, if we link it to other uh, fantasies, is that there can be very little art, because there's very little doing. There's a shrinking of options. There's, there's a shrinking of the possibilities for creation and discovery. It's not this infinite uh, range uh, and expanding sort of playground of creation, discovery, of artistic possibilities. Practice just ends up being almost like one, one thing in this all this kind of rhetoric and convincing um, ideas and images about openness and liberation, etc., actually ends up being quite narrow. Just actually doing the same thing over and over. And it's one thing, and it's not really leading anywhere except to the same thing over and over. So what's supposed to be open ends up being actually quite closed, or closing possibilities, closing uh, the possibility of art in, in the largest sense there. When we come to soul making Dharma, you know we've said this and we've emphasized it, we could we could, we could pick other 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 Dharma areas, emptiness or whatever, but it should just stay with soul making Dharma, you know. It requires so much by way of bases uh, of stepping stones, of prerequisites, preliminaries. It's so sophisticated and subtle, it's so wide and so deep. Um, excuse me, so many dimensions and aspects of our being excuse me um, um, are, are involved and demanded uh, you know made, demands are made from them and a lot, a lot of sophistication and subtlety and ability and facility in, in all these different areas one could say it's pretty elitist um, and actually, I, I would agree. I think it is elitist in that sense. I'm not sure what the etymology of elitist is, but um, probably has to do with choosing. But um, anyway, it is elitist in the sense that probably... Um, well, let, let's, let's say it the other way around. Um, I, I think, you know, and I think that... Uh, Again, picking up the music analogy a little bit, um, maybe a better image, maybe a better way of thinking about what we're doing, let's say, when we're teaching um, soul-making Dharma practice, we could actually say even teaching jhana practice or, or whatever, is a better way of thinking about it rather than the usual ways we practice. This is to do with liberation from suffering. This is to do with at least reducing suffering. And as such as a teaching about the reduction of suffering, reduction of stress, it's um, for everyone and available to everyone. And therefore we want teachings that anyone can apply and anyone can understand, and it's really important that they're accessible in that way. So there's a kind of legacy we get from the Four Noble Truths, which is that this is basically this is for reducing suffering, even if we, if we kind of... Uh, water it down a little bit and just say reducing suffering. There's a legacy we get from that. Um, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful legacy we get from the formula, which is so rich and so brilliant as a teaching, and so powerful as a teaching. We've talked about that lots before, but it's actually a mixed blessing, this legacy. It has, it has a shadow side, and I've talked about that as well. And particularly it has a shadow side when, when in this day and age we start to actually question what does a reduction in suffering actually mean, and what does it look like, and how noticeable is it at different levels? When we've uh, kind of done away with the universality of, a, a, or there is no more a universality of belief in that the end of suffering is the ending of rebirth. 
And what exactly do we mean by ending suffering? Been into that all that before. Um, but with all that, and we, we still want to, despite the c- massive confusion there, what actually do we mean by the third noble truth? And by implication, the first noble truth. And then, of course, the second and fourth. But, but principally the first and the third. What do we mean by suffering? What do we mean by ending suffering? The, in, in the kind of um, swamp of confusion that, that uh, has come w- w- with that in the aftermath of this kind of uh, dropping of, of a universality of what, what, what that looks like, whether it's even a Theravada universality or Mahayana universality or whatever. Um, and then coupled with that, that because it's reducing suffering, it somehow needs to apply to everyone. It needs to be equally applicable to everyone and accessible and everything. So that model, it brings with it all kinds of issues and problems and kind of, it brings with it its own its own sort of stumbling blocks and limitations. Sometimes, and more recently, um, I'm thinking, well, why not just conceive the whole thing like music school or art school? And we teach all levels at this music school or art school. And from beginners, never done any, never even put my lips to a recorder or whatever it is, never even banged on a drum with my fingers, whatever it is, shook a rattle. Um, we teach all levels, but we understand, and, and we teach right from that beginning level all the way, you know, just, just, there's no end to it, in fact. There's no end to where we stop, where we stop that. It's, it's a, uh, we can just keep going in this music school. But we understand only some, only some of the people who will want to take up music and come and learn and play and uh, develop and practice, etc. Only some of them will have a really deep desire, or that really deep desire to just play at the highest, deepest, freest levels. Of course, only some people will have. In that sense, it's elitist. It's up to you. So if elite is etymologically related to elect and and, and choose, uh, it's your choice your choice how far you want to go Any, everyone will be challenged by uh, some uh, something uh, or in relation to something within that whole range of what's possible there in practice and development but it's your choice and, and your choice about what you desire and how far you want to go and how much you want to develop things So that would be an example of, you know, just say, yes, it's elitist, no problem. What's the problem with being elitist? It's elitist in the same way that music school is elitist. It's not refusing anyone entry. They're just saying, well, yeah, but if you want to do that, then you need to do this first, because otherwise you won't be able to do that. Um, But we can teach you this, and after you do that, then, then, yeah, then let's talk about the other thing, if that's what you really want. Um, So sometimes, or more recently, I've just thought, that's a much better model but we're hampered a little bit and tied to this. Uh, we just keep thinking about words like liberation and uh, you know ending suffering or reducing suffering. And then and there's all kinds of other um, uh, accretions that go with that, particularly around non-elitism and accessibility and it's for everyone and all this stuff. Something might just be simpler to change, change the analogy. So I want to extend the, um, this is all still introduction, by the way. (laughs) I want to extend the analogy, uh, the musical analogy. Um, It gets a little limited here, but just rather extend one thread of of the music analogy. um, So there's uh, limitations, you know, to to any analogy, and they'll be clear here. But I think it's useful. Um, So... And I'm speak about music because obviously that's something that I have, as, as you know, it's something I have a history with. So I know, I know that whole area. Um, you know, sometimes. So I was a well, different kinds of musician at different times. I was a composer, but before that, I was a jazz musician, and I studied jazz and worked to develop my the art of improvising on the guitar. Uh, in, in, in sort of different jazz idioms and uh, something that I was completely dedicated to and put an enormous amount of energy um, into. 
Um, so I'll, I'll use that as an example. And, you know, sometimes what happens is um, what you've got there, and let's say learning to improvise jazz guitar, is you've got a lot of different skills and arts within within one thing. Learning to improvise jazz guitar, improvising jazz guitar, it's a lot of different skills and arts. It's not one thing, it's many, many. And... Uh, and again, it's it's just open ended and it's infinite in the possibilities there. And sometimes, what happens if you really get into all this stuff and give yourself to it? There's sometimes there's a sort of sudden growth of uh, ability, like of what you can do, what you can play or create or improvise, um, and you're not even quite sure how that sudden jump of level happened. Of course, it, it comes out of love. It comes out of um, loving what you're doing and loving that whole area and loving the music and it comes out of listening and listening with love and listening with eros you know to other musicians and, and music you love it comes of course out of playing and it comes definitely out of practicing um, but so it comes out of all those four things but it's not necessarily the case sometimes it's not necessarily the case that I practiced X and then I was able to do X of course, sometimes it is. I, I, I practice X, and then eventually I was able to do X. Great, so now I can do X. It's added to my, it's added to my playground. It's added to my, uh, the freedom that I that I have um, to create and discover musically in the moment. Um, but other times, I don't practice X. So sometimes I don't practice X, and. Um, and I'm, I'm somehow able to do X by some way I don't even understand how it happened. Probably more often than not, I don't practice X, and then I'm never able to do X, whatever X is. It will never appear in my playing. It will never appear in my creating, discovering, my improvisation, etc. Because I never practiced it. Um, so... Uh, I could talk a lot about this, but I want to keep it short. Um, if I had to, you know, I'm looking at death now and look back at my life and think and realize, you know, there's one grief, I think. I think there's one uh, grief, you know, obviously been in, in and out of lots of different relationships and situations and all, all kinds of things. And for me, there's one grief in my soul uh, that I think I will take with me to my grave. And uh, it's a, it feels like a deep soul grief. Um, and that is uh, specifically around um, not, how can I say this, not developing cer certain things uh, in, in jazz guitar, my ability to do certain things to, to a level that I would have liked. A level of virtuosity and fluidity specifically that I would have liked. So specifically it's about technique, actually. Um, I don't know, maybe that sounds very weird to some people to look back at that life and think, well, that, that's a strange thing to have grief about, I don't know, but to me, that's that's what it is, and it's, as I said, it's as far as I can tell, it's the one thing, and it goes very deep. For me, it's a real soul grief. Um, and in a way, there's a story behind that. I mean, I, I did develop um, all kinds of abilities on uh, jazz guitar, and some very sort of rare abilities, I would say, and abilities to do things that are yeah, really quite rare. Other things that were maybe less rare or more sort of ob obvious seeming, I, I never got the chance to develop. And the reason I never got the chance to develop them was partly, well, mostly because they weren't taught. Okay. Uh, there was no one at that time, there is now, uh, however many years later, 30 years later or more, um, more than 30 years later, um, there is now people teaching um, uh, electric guitar technique with, with, a, with a plectrum, with a pick. But back in those days it wasn't really taught. Um, so I went to music conservatories and college, and no one could teach that. They could teach it for every other instrument, because all those other instruments had hundreds of years of history behind them for people to figure out how do you teach uh, piano technique so that people can be very fluid and, and uh, you know, fly that way. 
But on the guitar, it seemed like no one really, no one really, if they could do that, they didn't really know how they figured out. It's sort of something they just stumbled across, and they didn't even realise quite what they were doing. Like they'd never put it under a microscope, it just worked, so they went with it. But a lot of people didn't, couldn't actually do, do that stuff, really, to, to the level that I'm talking about. Um, so I wasn't alone in this boat. And I had to kind of make do with what I could do and kind of work around my in, in, inabilities, my incapacities. Um, you know, and I feel, I feel really good about that. But there's, there's a grief here, you know. Um, and it has to do with just, again, this deep, unfathomably deep, visceral desire, calling, vocation um, for music to come through, which was then not physically, uh, not able, not enabled to be fully physically manifest. I'm going to say that again because this is really, I'm not just telling a story here, this is really key to what I'm talking about in all these talks. It was not enabled to become fully physically manifest. Not enabled to become fully physically manifest. Um, there wa- it was never explained to me. I couldn't find anyone to explain, to teach me those things, which on other instruments would be completely basic, completely like, well, this is just part of how you learn the instrument, exercises, etc. So there's a grief for me there. It's too late to go back. And I eventually gave up the guitar, got more into composing, partly because of that, because I felt the limitations, partly. I wanted to compose, eventually gave up that and became a Dharma teacher. So who knows? Had I got, um, you know, had I had available to me uh, that enabling and that teaching of that technique and was enabled to fully physically manifest that degree of um, uh, musical creation in improvisation, maybe I wouldn't have taken those other steps and I wouldn't be giving this talk today. I wouldn't be a Dharma teacher. But um, uh, that's also been very wonderful, of course. I know that you know that. Um, and I feel very much that's, of course, part of my calling too. Anyway, the point here, uh, actually there's lots relevant here, but for this talk there's one main reason for sharing this, and it's about this um, exercises that allow something to become fully physically manifest, that enable that possibility, those possibilities. Um, So just as there are lots of um, as I said, lots of elements or uh, techniques and capacities and um, abilities that go together to make up you know, being a, a, an improvising jazz guitarist. There are many that go to make up Dharma practice. There's lots in there. And there's lots even that go to make up soul-making Dharma practice. So when we come to soul-making Dharma practice, when we come to wanting to live a life of soul, we can hope you know, that just, well, I'll just practice and I'll just um, love all this soul-making business and I'll listen to the talks and I love them for the most part and I play and I meet with friends and, and we play soul-making together and all that stuff. And it may be, or I can hope, that it opens possibilities. Um, and it will open possibilities. But the question is, will it leave some possibilities uh, not opened to me, to to my practice, to my uh, to my soul making dharma practice, but also to my life and my life in soul and my soul in life. So we can hope, and maybe it will to a certain extent, but maybe not. When we talk about exercises and techniques, they're they're not everything. So some of you will be musicians. You know that you're playing a scale. It's not. It's not really music yet, you know. And some of these things that we're going to talk about, they're uh, they're not necessarily even soul making. I mean, they might might be. Um, excuse me. Um, um, excuse me. But like that. Um, a bone in, in the wing uh, of, of the bird, or near the wing of the bird, or like just the 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 the, the ability to do certain things, they are uh, crucial. They are absolutely crucial. They're not everything, but they are necessary for music. They're necessary for the fullness of soul. Fullness of soul making, formal practice, 
and the fullness of soul making in one's life and soul in one's life and soul through one's life and life in soul. So, what I want to offer, okay, that's the end of the introduction, I think. Um, what I want to offer is five exercises. And exercises means they're for practice, which means, in this sense, like doing technical exercises on the piano or whatever it is, or the scale, they're f they're f the point is repeating them, maybe. Gaining facility through the repetition. Not just something to do... Um, maybe once or twice, but actually doing them until you really don't need to do them anymore. Um, they're not necessarily soul-making, as we just said. They won't necessarily, these uh, exercises, bring a kind of sense of a wow experience or some kind of dramatic shift in anything. Sudden, suddenly I was doing this thing and uh, this exercise and following the recording and suddenly there was a shift. Um, they won't necessarily, I mean they might, but they won't necessarily do that. So five exercises. There's no prescribed order, I don't think, between these five. Um, but as I'm regarding those preliminaries, in a way I can get a sense of what I mean by that, um, so even if you're well into soul-making Dharma practice by now, there will still, there will still be good to add, I think, and to explore. No prescribed order. Um, they form part of what we might call a set of preliminaries, or might uh, hopefully again develop into a set of preliminaries and talk about other ones more later on. And so I want to explain more about the why uh, as, as we go through. Okay, so five exercises, no prescribed order. Um, well, I need to choose to start. So I'll, I'll start with one, uh, which I'll call exercise number one, um, but not because it's really number one. Um, we're just calling it. And, and it's a movement exercise, okay? And uh, so all of them have movement, gesture, and voice, and some of them are a lot more complex. Um, so this starts relatively simple, uh, relatively simply. Okay, exercise number one. And... Now, immediately you're going to hear there's lots of variations possible. So there's five exercises, but lots of variations within each exercise. Because this exercise can be done in two ways. Okay, It can be done as an actual physical movement. Your, your actual physical body is moving, and someone else in the room can see that you're moving. Or it can be done just with the energy body and the imagination, and there's no physical movement. Okay, so um, all the different variations within this exercise, number one, can be done either physically or just in the energy body and the imagination without the physical movement. Between these two possibilities, physical body or just energy body, there isn't an order. Uh, I don't, or I don't think there's an order. Try, try a different... You know, if you're going to do these, uh, you know, a number of times at least, I hope, then um, experiment with different orders. First the physical, and then not, and then the other way around, you know. Okay, so two large camps with physical and uh, just the energy body. Uh, also then, starting in four postures. So already we've got eight variations, right? We haven't actually started yet. Um... Um, so, four postures, sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. The four classic um, postures of the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, so that already leads to eight. And then the actual parts of the exercise, we're going to say there's five. <laughs> Actually, even even more. But, um, but you can see, it's just already proliferating variation. So it could, just in the energy body, standing. Okay, um, and then or physical movement um, starting in the in the walking posture. Okay, and they have different variations of these different um, different kind of categories of choice, if you like. Okay, so one category whether it's physical, whether it's just energy body. The second category, which of the four postures you're going to start in? Well, let's take as an example. Let's say you start standing. 
Um, okay, then there's five uh, parts of the exercise. Okay. Um, the first one is you adopt your starting posture and you feel the energy body. So let's say it's standing. You, you adopt the standing posture and you feel your energy body in that posture. And then you feel or imagine the energy body extending to fill the room that you're in. So that it touches the walls. Okay. And this isn't something we would always want to do uh, with the energy body at all. Usually we talk about energy body just a little bit bigger than the physical body. But here, you're with your primarily kinesthetic imagination, you're feeling imagining your energy body extending to fill the room and touch the walls of the room and the ceiling and the floor, etc. And what does that feel like? Maybe there's some visuals to it, but primarily you want it kinesthetic. Okay, so that's the first thing. You're just standing and you're uh, imagining doing that. Second, so this is second of five options, um, you begin to move, uh, so take, you have to really take your time working through these. So we really want the experience, the sense, the, the, the intention here, I'll repeat this at the end, the intention here is sensitivity to the energy body, and in this case also, and the projected or expanded energy body, and the space you're in. So really feeling a sense of uh, sensitivity to the energy body, sensitivity to the expanded energy body and uh, the kind of inhabiting or filling of the space you're in. That's the intention. It's primarily about sensitivity. Okay, so you've adopted the starting posture, you've expanded and you're feeling that. You've extended the energy body and you're feeling that. Second, you start moving your hands and your wrists and your arms slowly. Just in an improvised way. Move your hands and wrists and arms any way you want and feel your energy body and feel and again sense, imagine um, the, so to speak, imagine the space like as if like you're pushing uh, water or, or air, which you're doing as you move, you're pushing the air um, or the energy in the room. Or just imagine you're standing in a swimming pool uh, or, or floating in a swimming pool and you're alone in the swimming pool and just the movement of your arms is going to send ripples out. The movement of the body will just automatically send ripples out through through the space, through the uh, water there um, in the pool and they will reach the sides and then it will bounce off, etc. So what is it? We're not just talking about the space of awareness. We're not just talking about expanding the space of awareness. Okay, that's a different practice. We're talking about an energy body sense. Expanding, moving, and feeling, sensing and imagining the um, not just the space of the energy body in its usual size, but also the extended sense of the energy in the room and how that's connected with and impacted by and filled by uh, the energy of, of your body movements. Okay, so it's more than just the space of the awareness. We're talking about energy body uh, sensitivity here. Of course, the awareness must extend if we're going to do this exercise from, for example, the palms of my hands to the walls. So actually, I first have to have that much expansion of the awareness. But that's, we're saying more than that. Then it's this sense, imagination, felt kinesthetic sense of energy through the movement, in the movement, with the movement, uh, initiated by the movement, propped up by the movement, occupying, filling the whole space. This is just... Second part of this is your hands, your wrists, and your arms. Remember, this can be done physically. It can be done just in the imagination with the energy body. There's no obvious physical movement there. It could be done from the standing posture. It could be done from the 
uh, lying down posture, from the sitting posture, doesn't you know? There's all these variations. Okay. Okay. And spend some time doing that. A third uh, possible, third uh, stage is to then move your head and neck. Okay. Um, now you could stop moving your hands and arms uh, and wrists and just move your head and neck. But the same thing, the same awareness, the same sensitivity, the same expansion, the same uh, kinesthetic sense and imagination and feeling extending there. Or you could make it kind of cumulative. So now you're moving your hands and wrists and arms and your head and neck freely, improvisingly. Same thing, the sensitivity, uh, the imagination, the, the projection, the, the inhabiting, the filling of the space. And then fourth stage, to uh, you, uh, add your legs, your feet, your ankles. They can start moving slowly, improvisatedly. Again, that could be everything else becomes still and you just move them. Or you add that to the other the other areas of the body that are already moving, and then a last stage, um, improvised movement, including all the whole body, all the body. So the hips, the pelvis, the, uh, everything. Okay, so lots of variations in there, lots of possibilities in there. The intention is the sensitivity to the energy body in the, in the usual size sense, but also to the much more projected, uh, the larger size, the projected, expanded energy body, and the whole sense, if you like, of the space that you're in, and of inhabiting and filling that space with the energy body, or letting the energy body project um, to fill that space. Yeah? Another variation is that actually we can um, we can do the same thing with faster movements. Okay, so I would probably start it slower because you're going to have there's much more chance of the sensitivity, and this, this really does take a lot of sensitivity. This is the prime prime intention of this exercise. Actually, a lot of these exercises, the sensitivity. Actually, not all of them, but this, this for this one, um, and and actually the capacity to expand, the capacity to project, and not always be held back. Uh, I'll talk more about this later. But when you've done this a little a little while, then um, or when you've done this a few times, then you may want to experiment with faster movements, and it may well be that doing it faster is much more tricky to maintain and really tune in and feel have a good kinesthetic sense or imagination um, there. But see, see what happens. And if it's too fast, then you need to slow it down till you can find uh, what does work. Or maybe just keep, just stay with the fast a little longer because maybe it will come alive. Okay, so that's the first exercise. You can see lots of different variations there. Okay, I'm not going to repeat that because you can just rewind and listen to it again. Okay, second exercise also, I mean, I realize there's lots of variations, but actually, relatively speaking, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, it gets maybe a little more involved um, later on in the exercise. So the second exercise is a voice exercise. So the first one is really movement, we could say. The second one is a voice exercise. Again, uh, broadly speaking, we can do it two ways. We can do this voicing making an actual sound uh, that's audible, to ourselves and to others, or we can do it only imagining uh, making a sound and uh, and and feeling that in the energy body. So with image and energy body sense, there's not a physical sound, and and neither is there physical movement here. So two ways of doing it again, and uh, two ways of doing each each any element of it. And what we're going to do here is 
you're going to make you're going to sound extended tones, extended notes, vowels probably or syllables, or maybe they may be mantric syllables. In this exercise, it doesn't matter which. You know, it doesn't actually matter that much which sound or if it's a mantric syllable, which one. It it doesn't it doesn't matter for for this purpose uh, for these purposes at all. So make an extend. You hold a note for a long time, and you know, not not till you're out of breath, but just the idea is long notes. Um, and within that, you 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 have notes at different times, uh, higher notes or lower notes. Excuse me. So use your whole range, use your full range, however high you can go, however low you can go. It's not directly to do with stretching that range, but eventually it may be connected with that. But use your full range without being uncomfortable, high and low. First thing with, to notice is, where in the body is the centre of emanation of this sound that you're making right now? Can you notice and feel? At the same time as you're, again, let's say you're standing there doing this, um, you're, you're still feeling your whole energy body, as we do pretty much any practice, feeling the whole energy body as at least a background. You've still got there that whole energy body awareness. But where in the body is the center of the emanation of, of, of the sound? Can you notice and can you feel that? So any any trained singer at least will anyway singers really should be aware of this different pitches will will feel like they're coming from different places in the body a very high pitch come, comes from actually higher in the body or feels like it does like in the top of the head right from the top of the head to the pelvic bone is the usual place where a singer will feel or someone voicing will feel is the sort of center of resonance, the center of emanation of the sound. So the first thing is, can you just notice and feel where it's coming from? Within that range, from the top of your head, the crown of your head, to, to your pelvic bone, right down to your perineum. And you've got the whole energy body awareness, and then you notice where the center is. Then actually, can, can you, is it possible to include the arms and legs and the possibility that the sound uh, may or can you feel it just a question can you feel it as also emanating from your arms and legs as well can it come from the whole energy body and again usually energy body is bigger than physical body a little bit do you notice um, that it's easier to feel and to sound from certain places than others. Actually, not so much hit the note, but actually to feel the center of emanation and be comfortable with it, um, really emanating strongly and surely and uh, full-bloodedly and embodiedly, embodiedly from that center. So over time, you might, no you might notice it's oh, it's kind of like the lower belly. It's hard for me to really inhabit that and fill it out and let that really be a center. Something's I don't know blocked, is it, or just not available there, or I don't know what it is. Okay, I don't have to figure it out, but just to notice. Whereas something up in the throat is much more possible, or higher note, other people the other way around. So notice. And maybe over time, with practice, it might be that they become the whole range becomes more evenly available. That the sound that you're sounding, that the body is sounding, can emanate uh, full-bloodedly, full-bodiedly, with full presence and full oomph from any place in the body. And you're comfortable. It doesn't feel like mm, somehow it's a bit of a dead spot or it's hard to get a feeling there or whatever. So that's the first, um, the first uh, part of this second exercise, five parts. Where in the body is the center of emanation of the sound? Um, actually, I've already mentioned the second one, uh, which is, can I have the sense of the whole energy body emanating? Again, this is something I'm almost certain that I've thrown out 
at different times. I'm pretty sure I uh, encouraged it in the instructions when we were doing the hearing all sounds as mantra, when we were doing that guided meditation. So I think, where's your voice coming from? It's coming from my mouth and my throat, right? But actually, what is it to really feel? Let yourself imagine it at first. But to have a kinesthetic imagination, a felt sense of the whole energy body, which again means a little bit bigger than the physical body, the whole energy body emanating that sound. It's really coming from that whole space. Okay, so that's the second, uh, the second part of the exercise. Third part of the exercise, can the sound that you're making and the sense of the energy body uh, be feel like they're mixed together, to quote from the Buddha, like water in milk? So they're not exactly the same thing, but once you mix them together, it becomes almost impossible to tell them apart. They're not going to separate like oil and water. Can you sense, get a kinesthetic sense and an aural sense as well of the sound and the energy body mixed together almost uh, hard to tell the, almost impossible to, to, to um, kind of separate them apart they almost become uh, palpably the same thing Sound is the energy body, is vibration. The vibration is the sound. The energy body is sound, has become sound, has become vibration. Okay, fourth part of the exercise. Um, We've got this awareness of the energy body, as usual, and we've got the awareness of the sound, of course. And, to add to it, similar to the first exercise, a sense of the the space around you and the the waves in the pool, the ripples in the pool around you. Now, actually, sound is, is in fact, waves in the air. That's what actually makes sound. Sound is uh, waves in, in air. But what is it to have the energy body awareness, to have the awareness of the sound, to be really in that, open to that, sensitive to that, and then also open the awareness to the sense of the space around, the sense of the medium, if you like, and imagine, feel, hear that medium resonating with the sound, filled with the sound, that sound, that energy that you are sounding, that's coming through you, is filling the space, is reaching the walls. Can you get a kinesthetic felt sense, a kinesthetic imaginative sense, um, hearing it and feeling it as reaching the walls, the ceiling, the floor, etc. Filling the space. Okay. And sometimes they think, oh, well I need to get louder. Um, Not necessarily. So, here's a a little sub-variation. Some, actually, let's not say some people, sometimes it's good. Get loud. Let yourself get loud. Because sometimes that's also, and this is very related to one of the reasons why I'm doing this, sometimes some people really hold themselves back from being loud. And there's a whole, I'll well, return to this. So sometimes let yourself get loud. It's part of filling the space. But you can also have this sense of filling the space, of projecting with the energy body and the sound, and letting it fill, and letting it fill and... Uh, impact and shape and flow through and uh, uh, penetrate the the medium um, when you're not necessarily getting louder, even in a big room. And it still feels like you're imagining even that it's projecting. You're feeling it as projecting and filling the room. So that was actually again. I've, I've uh, said it. You know, this is the um, the fifth variation. It's sometimes to do it loud and sometimes to do it soft. Okay. So I've run through because I wasn't. I, I uh, 
elided some of them together. So the first, first part is, remember, all this can be with sound or just with the imagination and the energy body. Extended tones, doesn't matter what. High and low pitches, different pitches over your whole range. First part, where in the body is the center of the emanation of the sound? Can you notice that? Can you feel it? Whole, uh, whole tip of head to pelvis, and then actually include more and see where is it easier? And what happens over time to that sense of where it's easier to have that sense of the center of the emanation? Second part, can, can, can you have a felt sense, a felt imagination of the whole body emanating? The whole body radiating sound that way. Third part, can the sound and the energy body become mixed? The vibration, the resonance and the energy body become mixed like water and milk. Like milk and water. Fourth part, um, with the energy body and the aware and the sound awareness, the awareness of the energy body and the awareness of sound, can we also um, uh, feel, imagine, hear, get a kinesthetic and aural sense of the me- the whole medium of the space that we're in, and the whole space that we're in resonant with that sound, filled with um, filling that space with the sound and energy, reaching the walls, etc. And fifth, can we do that both loudly and softly, but it still uh, fills, expands, radiates. Okay. So I'm going to stop there now and introduce uh, and go through the other exercises in another part. And so these are relatively simple. Um, but still, I think, really worth doing. And they may sound completely boring or pointless to you. Hopefully I'll explain more about why uh, why they're important. Um, but I hope that's clear enough for now. And we'll stop there. Okay. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.